For the next hour, we're going to look at art and advocacy, and we're going to explore the intersection between these two. Here at the Physicians Committee, we've known for a long time that sometimes you do have to knock people out of their complacency with a striking video or a TV commercial or a billboard, or sometimes you got to wrap an entire bus in, in a big work of art to get people's attention. And I am sorry to say that sometimes the arts can be co-opted by people with a not so helpful message. And I, I'm not talking about just the people who design the KFC and Velveeta packages, but you know, there are people who are making gorgeous commercials to make you almost wish you had the disease that's treated by their not entirely pronounceable drugs. Um, these are all ways that art is used or sometimes abused and whatever. Uh, art has a not entirely rational side that's used for all kinds of messages. So to explore art and advocacy, we've got an incredible panel for you today. Uh, in a few minutes, we are going to hear from Moby, who is the musician, artist, advocate extraordinaire, and we're going to talk about his music and the interface with visual arts and how his personal advocacy for compassion fits into all this. And we're going to watch one of his, uh, if you don't mind my saying this, most heartbreaking, eye-opening uh, videos. We're going to also talk with musician and composer Bob Gray and with Physicians Committee attorney. Uh, Deborah Press, but what I'd like to start with is uh, Dave Plunkert. You know Dave Plunkert's art. You may have seen it on the cover of The New Yorker, seen it on Barron's and The New York Times Book Review and other leading magazines. And it's often, to my eye, very simple, but totally disarming. And uh, Dave Plunkert is a Baltimore artist who also did uh, iconic videos for the musicians. They might be giants. And his new video, for Carbon Works, I'm proud to say is really cool and getting some unexpected reactions. So welcome to the program, Dave. Thanks, Neil. Uh, Dave, let me ask you, your work, it mixes art along with some advocacy. For example, I was really struck by the New Yorker cover that you did of the Ukraine invasion. And I guess my question, Dave, is how do you take something as frankly, devastating and, and complicated as Russia invading Ukraine? And how do you turn this into something that's approachable? Well, when that uh, cover was created, uh, there wasn't any devastation at that moment. So in the news cycle, uh, Russia was just getting ready to invade. Um, so when the New Yorker contacted me and other artists to present covers, uh, there wasn't an idea of what was actually going to happen. So. I think at that moment, uh, the tanks were getting our line, were lining up a, along the border. And uh, so I believe I just took like kind of the idea that, well, they're going to roll in and they're going to follow each other. So it's really kind of like making a stark comment and allowing uh, the reader to kind of fill in the gaps of the idea that there are multiple tanks following those tracks. So what I hear you saying is, maybe keeping the message simple enough and letting the, the viewer come in and fill in the blanks? Exactly. The New Yorker is one of the few publications that lets a drawing be a drawing. So there's no text that supports the picture. So somebody has to understand it. So in that regard, that's why the tank is like really taken down to just its simple shape. Uh, so if somebody says Putin who, that's that's not the, the, the reader who's going to be going to the New Yorker. It's got to be somebody who knows the issue and you're going to illustrate it. Right. How do you strike this balance so that your work is, it's got a message that's coming through, but it's also got to be attractive and appealing? When I'm working on a cover, I try to make it work like a poster. So in that regard, trying to keep it down to its simple, uh, basic essentials. I try to get rid of any extraneous details that might mess up the message. Uh -huh. now, Dave, I got to say, there is a cat that crops up in your work, I have noticed. And probably all of our viewers today don't care about anything else except your cat. Tell me about your cat. We're, we're, gonna, well, we're, gonna, show, we're gonna show an image of, image of your cat. The black and white cats on the tolerance poster are not my cats. Uh, those are just symbol cats for people getting along. But you have a cat too. I have two cats, two Tom cats, but and they are in black. And what are their names? My cat's names are Ringo and Reggie. They are uh, rescue cats. Very good. Well, they're, they're lucky to have you. Uh, Dave, your brand new video was created for Carbon Works. And if you don't mind, Dave, I, I want to just share a little bit of backstory about this. It was back in the 1980s. I met guitarist Bob Gray, who's going to be with us in just a minute. And we formed a band and we played at the 
the 930 Club, back when there was a 930 Club, uh, 930 F Street, and Bob wrote this song called Training That Works. And I thought this was sort of a lighthearted David Byrne type of song. Um, and it's now a video uh, done by one Dave Plunkert. So uh, let's watch Training That Works. And then Dave, I'm gonna come back and ask you about it. Dave, Training That Works, that is an incredible video. Tell me, what goes through an artist's mind when this music is sort of percolating through the through your brain? I'm usually fighting against my own limitations and trying to bring something forth that's going to, in this case, make Bob happy, because uh, he wanted this to be sort of a lighthearted, uh, the guy in the video is happy to be getting training at work. Um, I'm a little bit darker, so 
I think some of my Fritz Lang metropolis uh, point of view kind of crept into it a little bit. Um, but generally, uh, I start by basically doing like very light uh, thumbnail drawings. And uh, when I get something that's kind of amusing to me, I'll share that with, uh, in this case, Bob. Cool. Well, let's, let's bring in Bob. Uh, I'd like to introduce Bob Gray who has been a friend and collaborator for decades. And I, we met back when I was a medical resident uh, here in Washington. We formed a band and we were playing around quite a lot. And, and Bob, you wrote Training That Works. Uh, tell us about it. <laughs> well, it's, um, <clears throat> it's one of these things where uh, I had just started a job and it was a, it was a uh, corporate communications job as a writer, I was working for a company that was creating software and uh, they had all, they would, they would bring in all of the kind of industry publications and I would flip through them and look at them like ad age and whatever. And there was one uh, that had this big full page ad that was, uh, that was geared toward employees and companies and toward their managers, et cetera. And it was promising a set of uh, training opportunities that were really would would work for the <laughs> to make a better employee. And and that the headline would cross this page was just training that works. And I found that so amusing. Uh, and I'm not really sure why, but you know this is this is sort of this crazy. A uh, very free um, process that you go through when you're when you're just sort of in a creative mood. You're not necessarily sure what it means, what it applies to, why it's striking you that way, but you're going to take it and do something with it. And you know, at the same time, Neil, we had this band, and we were trying to get gigs, and we needed music, right? So I'm like, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to write a tune about it. And, uh, you know, in those days, that was that the, that kind of um, point of view, I think, was quite popular to, uh, you know, there were bands like the B-52s and, uh, you know, the Talking Heads and others who who would present these fairly banal kind of narratives in their songs. But in the case, particularly in the case of, of the Talking Heads and David Byrne, the, the banality of the delivery of the lyrics uh, would kind of would would mask the profundity of what they were saying. Now I'm not saying that this tune that I wrote was profound. It, it's it's I don't think it is, but it's an observation. You know, it's it's an observation about a guy who uh, who gets a job, and he has this job, and he's offered this training at, through his work, and he's going to take it, but at the same time. He has this own. He has his own kind of mind that's working, and I think this is the thing that that uh, that we all have, and we all have to figure out as as people living in the world. You know, we have our rich inner lives. We want to be whatever we want to be, and we and we believe in our stories, and we love our fantasies, and we travel with them. At the same time, we have to make peace with the realities of the world. We have to go, we have to work, we have to meet, we have to do these things. And this guy, you know, in some ways has found this sort of equilibrium uh, that, that his boss and others end up finding envious. I th and, and this is the extraordinary thing that, that, uh, that Dave brings to it because uh, this is a collaboration. This song didn't mean all these things when I wrote it. It was just a cool thing, I thought. And, you know, and Neil came up with his part and the bass player and we just figured this tune out and it sounded good. And uh, and, it, and it made a kind of a crazy musical sense that not necessarily adds up to a directed message as much as an observation. And the, that ambiguity uh, Dave picked up very well on and um, gave it this kind of, you know, uh, it, 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 you don't. I mean, you don't really know. Is this guy like selling out to the corporate cog? You know, is he just becoming like, I'll do anything. I don't care. Or is he a guy who has sort of found this key toward being self uh, self realized in the context of a, of an oppressive world? And and that's sort of the you know 
how do you want to go with this? Which way do you want to take the story? It depends on you as the viewer. You know, you can take it either way you want to go or any other way you want to go. And that's the beauty of collaboration. It's, it's expand, you know, Davis just expanded the idea of this, of this, for me anyway. Wonderful. You know, to my eye, Dave's video, your song, you put it together. It, to me, it's, it's a Rorschach ink blot. In other words, I think the, 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 the uh, viewer is going to come in and fill in a lot of things. And so um, there's somebody else that I want to bring into this discussion. I'd like to bring in Deborah Press. Because I think some people looking at training that works, they're going to say uh, it's Charlie Chaplin. It's modern times. It's Charlie Chaplin getting caught up in the gears of a factory. But uh, Deborah Press is uh, the uh, is an attorney here on staff. She's the associate general counsel for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And Deborah, I couldn't help but think of you when this video came out because there is a certain chunk of it that I know just went straight into your head. Uh, Deborah, welcome <laughs> to the program. Thanks, Matt. Uh, De Deborah, tell me about uh, your reaction to training that works. Yeah, if this is a, a, a Rorschach test, I think I definitely fall on the darker side of, uh, of the darker interpretation like Dave. Um, I, I saw this as a kind of an apocalyptic scenario where we have this, uh, this worker, this character, um, who in one scene has his head shaved and he is um, given a robotic skull cap and, and it immediately triggered uh, thoughts of, of some of our work at PCRM, our advocacy to expose uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink companies uh, experiments on primates. And I don't know if uh, our viewers here are familiar with that company, but a Neuralink is a, it's uh, an implant, and the uh, goal of this technology is to interface with a computer using only your mind. So that's what I saw in this video, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I saw, yeah. That's, that's wonderful. Well, you know, I, I have to say, um, the timing couldn't have been either better or worse, depending on how you how you, how you look at it. it. Wasn't it this week the Daily Mail did a, did a whole big headline about Elon Musk and the fact that you are in court fighting <laughs> Elon Musk and his experiments right now? Uh, do I have that right? And and uh, tell tell so it's he takes monkeys, puts in brain implants into the monkeys, and this all sounded uh, fun fr from a from an Elon Musk standpoint until you discovered. What did, what did you discover about the underbelly of, of this, this experiment that, that uh, gave people nightmares? A, a few years ago, PCRM learned about this research that was going on. And we learned about it because Neuralink and Elon Musk's company was actually conducting these experiments at a public institution. It was the University of California, Davis. Um, so when uh, a private company does research through a public institution, all records of that research become public records. So we uh, went about getting those records and we hit some roadblocks. Not surprisingly, they didn't want us to see records of these experiments that they were doing on monkeys. You know, these experiments involved drilling holes into the skulls of monkeys um, and uh, implanting this, this Neuralink device. So um, we got, we got hundreds of records, but there were 371 photographs that UC Davis refused to release to us. Um, not surprising, they don't want the public to see photos of these monkeys with these um, very invasive uh, devices implanted in their, in their heads. So we're in court right now um, with UC Davis to try to get those photographs. And just today, Neuralink intervened in that lawsuit because what happened is when they packed up and left UC Davis to go to their new headquarters in Texas, um, and I believe they're also in California, they took those photos with them. So their argument is that the, the photos are no longer with this public institution, they're not public, and we're saying that's not the case. So Neuralink is now a party to this lawsuit. And Neuralink being uh, Elon Musk. Well, I, I can imagine when Bob wrote this song and when Dave um, put a, had, a, had a guy putting something in the brain of a person, that, that boss 
doesn't look like Elon Musk and the, the guy doesn't look like a monkey, but I could, I could see why you would think this because suddenly it's unclear who is controlling who um, in this and, and the controls are all over the place. And, uh, and with Elon Musk, it was all kind of happy uh, uh, headlines about what he was gonna do until the veterinary reports came in of the animals dying and the terrible conditions. So, all right, well, to be continued. Good, I, I, I could see exactly why you would see that in this, <laughs> in this uh, video. All right, stick around, Deborah. I'm gonna bring you back into the discussion. But what I'd like to do now is I'd like to bring in Moby into the discussion if I can. Moby is a music superstar and he's been doing this in every possible way. His album Play was just a revolution. But uh, Moby, let me bring you in. I want to say that your work has touched the minds, it's touched the hearts of people in so many ways, in so many genres. And uh, I'd like to start actually with what is it that in, in your life led you to decide that being an artist was maybe not enough, that advocacy had to be had to be part of it. First, first of all, Moby, welcome. And Hi. Hi. Um, I mean, part of it was the sort of environment I was brought up in. Uh, you know, we were all, I assume, around in the, the 60s into the 70s. And I was raised by artists and academics and activists uh, and sort of raised with this idea that one, generally, broadly speaking, the people in power are self-interested and probably relatively dishonest. And it's everyone else's job to be as informed as possible and to use whatever talents and abilities you might have to push the needle away from corruption, uh, away from complacency towards presumptuously what might be a better future. Now, as I understand it, one day you happened to walk by, I guess, a dump or a dumpster or something like that. You found some kittens. Um, tell, tell me. Yeah, so I, I actually did a TED Talk about this. Um, and I, I've had what I think of as a few kind of almost like self-evident Saul on the road to Damascus epiphanies. And one of the first ones was when I was around 10 years old, I was living in Connecticut and I was walking by the dump and I heard this tiny little mew sound and I opened a box and inside the box were three dead kittens and one barely alive kitten. And I scooped up this barely alive kitten because I had been raised like a lot of people with rescue animals. We had rescued dogs, rescued lab rats, rescued iguanas, rescued everything. And so I loved animals, but also I ate animals. You know, I was a kid growing up in the suburbs, so I loved Burger King, I loved pepperoni pizza. So I scooped up this little baby cat and somehow he survived. And he lived to be about 19 years old and he was my absolutely my best friend, just like the smartest, happiest cat you ever met. His name was Tucker. And then fast forward nine years, I was around 19 years old and I was petting Tucker, who at this point was a you know healthy, happy adult cat. And all of a sudden, the sort of the paradoxical, like the, the, the neurological paradox in my brain was healed or connected. And what I mean by that is up until that point, I had just thought it was perfectly normal to love animals and also eat animals. I thought it was perfectly normal to revere animals and contribute to their suffering and death. And all of a sudden in this one moment when I was 19 years old, I realized, no, that you know, respecting animals, loving animals means in no way contributing to their suffering and death. And so that was 1984. And that's when I be became a vegetarian. Then I became a vegan in 87. And really that my life's work is doing anything and everything I can to end the use of animals by and for humans. 
Now, tell me about your song. Um, Why does my heart feel so bad? Um, this song is striking in its simplicity. Um, it's got what three or four lines of lyrics. Um, relatively simple instrumentation, but it is just a gut punch. T tell me about that song and, and tell me about the video that, that went with it. Well, there are a couple of videos and I hope we're playing the more recent one because the first video was made in 1999 and it's a bit, it's charming, but it's pretty rudimentary. And the more recent one was made by a phenomenal animator named Steve Cutts. But people are probably familiar with his work because he's done a lot of really very powerful activist videos. Uh, but the song itself is a simple, I guess I'd call it a simple orchestral gospel song. And when I was growing up, I mean, I might have been at the 930 Club when Carbon Works was playing because that was my world, you know, like playing in punk rock bands, playing in new wave bands, you know, going to see the Feelies and the Bongos and the Flesh Tones and Talking Heads and, I, you know, I remember seeing Talking Heads in Central Park the first time they had that expanded band when they did Remain in Light. So that was my world. So why does my heart feel so bad? It's a very rudimentary song. Everything about it's very simple, but somehow in that simplicity, it seems to, I mean, hopefully this doesn't sound presumptuous, but it's just, it seems to connect with people. Well, it certainly does. It connects with me and I, you have performed it in many different ways with many different musicians and it's been rendered visually in different ways. And yes, we're going to look at, at uh, the new version. Let's have a look at why does my heart feel so bad?
feel so bad Why does my soul feel so bad What a powerful video that is, Moby. Now, there was something that I once heard you say, Moby. You said it, was, it would be wonderful to live in a world where artists could just do whatever they want and not worry about the state of the world. Unfortunately, that's not the world that we live in. Um, yeah, it would be wonderful if we all lived in that world where we could just be Pollyannas and hedonists and Sybarites and just run around and not have a care in the world. But as we know, every metric points to the fact that the world, and, I, and it's such a depressing, self-evident thing to say, the, the world is ending. As far as our, you know, it's, it, the, the anthropocentric world, we're done. You know, like, I mean, whether it's climate change, antibiotic resistance, um, microplastics, ocean acidification, pandemics, I mean, like, Things are, things are not looking good for humans. And I, if I'm being completely honest, I'm a little more concerned for the animals than I am for the humans. Like a world without people might not be the worst thing. Um, my fear and the thing that breaks my heart is that we're taking the animals down with us. And, you know, so if the humans disappeared, that's myself included, like that's not so bad. It's the animals and and the ecosystems that actually concern me a lot more. Now, how do you approach what I'm going to call a taboo subject? Um, as you mentioned, um, we love animals, but we eat animals. When, when you raise that, um, all of a sudden, uh, people will, I'm guessing, that much of your audience might feel feel threatened by that message. Um, aren't you Moby, the, the DJ? Aren't you the guy who makes us jump around? No, wait yeah. a minute. Suddenly you've got an idea that you want me to listen to. Uh, I mean, part of it is, you know, there's this old part of me that, you know, I, I grew up playing in punk rock bands and punk rock was confrontational. So there's this part of me that just wants to, like, get in people's faces and yell at them and not care about the consequences. But if I if there's a 16 year old punk rock kid, sure, I might be confrontational with him. If I'm talking to my 81 year old aunt there's a good chance confrontation is not going to work very well. Like if I start yelling at her, she'll just cry and like take a nap. So it's crafting the activist strategy for the environment in which you're communicating and towards the people you're communicating to. And also there's this balance that I think we all live in, which is, because obviously, like, speaking our truth, we run the risk of offending people. Is that bad? And what makes it bad? Like, it's bad if, if it means they ignore the message. And I, I guess what I'm trying to say is finding the balance between attenuating activist communication in a way that enables you to be a more effective activist. Because there's also the ego aspect. I mean, there's so many people and musicians and artists who are understandably afraid to speak up because they don't want to compromise their revenue streams. They don't want to stop getting invited to parties at fancy townhouses in Brooklyn. They, you know, people have to like bite their tongue because they don't want to piss off the cognoscenti. That is ego as far as I'm concerned. And I have to be very aware that like my ego doesn't matter. What matters is being an effective voice for the animals and pretty much that's it. Let's bring everybody back in. I'd love to have a discussion about exactly this point because I think you've been touching on something that I am guessing everybody in this call has thought about from time to time, which is um, what is my balance between making something that's artistic, um, get, getting that message out there in a way that, that, that works well um, or um, is the art totally destroyed? Um, it, you, I don't know if you've had the experience of being in the coffee house and somebody's got a poem, which is things that they want to shout out at people, but that nobody else really wants to hear. So um, I, I, I guess that's a question for anybody. Um, 
where, um, how do we, how do we get this balance? Uh, Dave, over to you. In w- at one point, I think I was, I was working on a poster for, um, you know, it, it was in regards to just how many billionaires we have. And, uh, you know, I had this idea of like having the, having the poster and like cut in the shape of a guillotine. And, you know, I remember showing it to my, my daughter and she's like, you know, th- that really could be construed as, as a violent act. And, you know, at that point I kind of, I pulled back and didn't do it. Um, mainly because that, that, that kind of goes against my, my personal feeling in regards to, you know, if there's, if there's something to be, if there's a problem to be solved. I, I don't want, I don't want somebody to, to use violence to solve it. Um, so I think in a lot, that's it. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Okay. So, you know, I, I, in that regard, I might, I might think if I might think something in terms of like, well, you know, that, that would be the thing to do. But then I, I don't want someone else to like pick up that, pick up that action and do something that I would disagree with. But that, the, the trick is like, you know, how people are actually going to interpret your message. Um, you don't really have control how someone's going to interpret what you put down on paper or what you put out as a song. Um, so that's where I think your experience has to come in in regards to uh, at least being careful in regards to that what message you want to you want to send is going to be taken the right way. One of the things that we talked about uh, a lot early on, we were thinking about how to how to turn a song of mine into a video would be, um, you know, how do we maintain this ambiguity? And uh, I think that's an important an important idea that art can be ambiguous. It can have, it can contain more than one message and it can contain, uh, it can reflect back on the, the, the observer or the listener, um, what they're seeing and based on how they think about the world, they might take it in a different direction. And this is, this is not like work that is intended to be specifically, um, advocating anything in particular, it's more observational. And the observation then becomes the uh, the playground, like how do you observe it and what do you see? And how do you then take that and, and interpret it in whatever way, like, like Deborah, your interpretation of training that works is a very interesting one and has a lot to do with your current experiences with what you're working on. Someone else might hear it who is just, you know, they've, they're just like, they've got a job they know they have to have. And uh, here, you know, maybe this guy has figured out a way to sort of make peace with the outer world and by having a rich inner life in a way. So there's different, different ways that people, people bring their experiences to every piece of piece of art, a rework of art. And for a lot of artists, uh, you know, I mean, I think, advocacy can play a part and, and is a is a part of what's going on but for many people many artists i think the more important issue is to observe you know to observe the world and reflect the world back and um it doesn't mean that there's not a a, a place for advocacy and art but i think there's also a place for this kind of ambiguity that is Uh, reflective of of the observer. Yeah, I I mean, I'm just going to jump in as a consumer of art. I'm not a creator. But, you know, I think, um, of course, there's like political, there's expressly political music and visual art. But, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about what you all have said about ambiguity and about writing emotional music. And and I think that's what, um, when you come at some of these issues sideways is is the way you really affect people. You know, that's what hooks are about. Hooks in music, they really, they hook you. They get in inside of you and they change how you think. And a song or a piece of art can make you feel something that changes your mind without preaching at you or without, um, you know, explicitly stating a message or it can make you reimagine the world. Um, like this video to me really made me kind of reimagine um, the like the working world where this this worker you know looked like kind of a happy machine um, in this working world and it made me think about you know workers and labor differently so and it wasn't a preachy piece of art it wasn't a preachy song or video and I I really um, 
I think that's that's the beauty of art. It can be political. It can make you think. It can change your mind without telling you what to think. I wonder if sometimes people are uh, purposefully hear a message and then push it away. I don't want to see that message. What, what got me thinking about this was years ago, uh, the Smiths had uh, an iconic album called Meat is Murder. Um, that was a huge thing. What, 1982, three, four, some, something in there. And Morrissey relayed this story that um, someone was upset because um, people were, um, w with, with the Smith's permission, they were, they were handing out vegetarian recipes at one of their conference, uh, uh, concerts or something like that. Anyway, somebody got upset and said, why are you destroying the, the element of this song? It's not about me being murdered. That's just a, whatever. That's not what it's about at all. And Morrissey was saying, I couldn't have said this more explicitly. <laughs> Why is it that people, I mean, I wrote it in, 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 in words on the cover. Nobody wants to hear this. They want to push it away. Um, anyway, I don't know if I said that clearly, but sometimes you have a message that is so obvious right out there. People say, well, I don't really want that to be the message I want to hear today. Well, people don't, people don't like having the status quo challenged. And unfortunately, if I'm going to be a cranky old guy right now, I'm going to say that a lot of art is currently just sort of reinforcing a status quo that is pernicious and destructive and unsustainable. Like the status quo needs to be turned on its head and thrown out as far as I'm concerned. And art that perpetuates this status quo of complacency, it just, it's, it's almost irresponsible, I would say. Sorry to be the, the Molotov cocktail throwing bourgeois revolutionary here, but it's just, there's no good part of our culture right now. It's like it kind of is across the board needs to be questioned and rejected and replaced with something sustainable and healthy for every organism involved. And Moby, I know that you've had this experience too, where you might write a song, you're delivering a song and somebody is not going to be aware of your intention. They're going to app applique their own thing to your song, to your, or to your whole album. Yeah. I mean, the, once any once you, I mean, there are a few different ways to look at that, but one is that when whatever we make leaves our laptop or leaves our studio, it's no longer ours. Like we can't control how people are going to respond to it. I mean, there's that, that democratic chaos, that wonderful sort of like anarchy that attends the release and the consumption of art, music, literature, what have you, like it's, it's out of our control. And oftentimes people will radically reinterpret things swastika style. And there's not much you can do. You just have to sort of, you know, accept that, you know, the world is a gigantic, complicated place and you can't control the way in which art is received or consumed. Is, is a good example of the, the difference between, I don't know if the word motivation is right, but the activity of making art versus the activity of consuming art. I mean, they're two different realms. You know, the, the making of something, the solving of the problems required to get something done and get it shaped the way you like it is a very different activity than the activity of then observing and uh, trying to come to grips with the piece of, of work, whatever it is. And so they're, they're very different activities. You know, in, in many cases, it's like the artist would be the last person you want to ask about what they're trying to do. They could either you know, be like, I'm trying to get red to work with green against this background. You know, it's like I'm trying to solve a visual problem. And so, yeah, I mean, not that that's all they're doing, but you know, this this is different. It's a different realm. And it's play just the way your point, Moby. This uh, playwright that I used to know who said, you know, once you write it, it's like giving birth to a little baby, and now it's going out into the world, and it's going to have its own life, and you can't really, you know, that's not your life anymore. It's its life, and it's it's out there. Different types of art. We, we think about painting and music and sculpture and dance and, and uh, film and that kind of thing. But I am sometimes wondering if law cannot be an art. 
Um, I, I've had this feeling sometimes myself where I'm writing a scientific paper and I'm doing statistics and I'm fashioning something that I'm hoping will have a certain effect on the reader. And Deborah, when I read legal briefs and things that you do, um, you're trying to create a reaction in, first of all, in, in the overall world that you want to influence, but also in a specific person. I'm talking about a judge um, or something like that. And I, Deborah, I wonder if you sometimes feel like your work is not just facts, and not just research, but uh, an art form in its own way. You know, I, I think that advocacy is creative. I definitely think advocacy is creative. Um, I think that, you know, as an advocate, uh, I wrestle with a lot of the questions you all have been describing. The question of what is going to be the most convincing way to reach people. Um, is it to be direct? Is it to be indirect? Is it to let them come to a conclusion on their own? Is it to tell them exactly what to think? Um, is it to let evidence speak for itself? Um, is it to let images speak for themselves? I mean, you know, that's what we're doing with this Neuralink case. We're trying to get photographs. We're trying to let the images of this oppressive um, experimentation speak for themselves. So I think that I think that's a very interesting question. I would never, I don't think you'd meet too many lawyers who you'd want to spend time with who would call themselves artists, but you would, you, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think there, there are certainly um, puzzles that you have to wrestle with when you are trying to um, argue and make change. So yeah, I, th I think that's a, that's a very interesting question you're writing your your brief and suing to get these pictures out so that we could show the world what what Elon Musk was doing uh, at the same time your team also wrapped two or three buses the entire bus in the words what are you hiding and had them driving around where was it Austin and or wherever Elon Musk was at the at the moment so uh, you're getting his attention in that way too I have to say that was uh, quite a performance art oh David can I, I I need to be a fan for one second um one of, I've been a New Yorker subscriber since I was about five years old. And one of the most powerful covers, and I believe this is yours, was the Trump in a sailboat with the Klan hood sail. Like the simplicity and the, it was one of those moments where I was like, I went to the mailbox, I took the New Yorker out of the mailbox and I looked at it and it's like, it stopped me in my tracks. It was so perfect. So Sorry to be, I don't want to make you uncomfortable by being a fan, but I'm a fan. Oh, well, thank you so much. I love We, we Are Made of Stars. <laughs> um, I mean, there's no ambiguity in that New Yorker cover, I don't think. You know, and I think uh, I wanted to touch on that a little bit in that, you know, I think in the Training That Works video, uh, we're not making an overt political message um, and I think you can bring politics into it, but I think that's in the, that's from the viewer, not from Bob's intent or not in my intent. Um, but I think when, if I'm working on something for the New Yorker for, um, uh, gun control or, um, a, a image of, uh, that's against racism, I, I don't really want any ambiguity, uh, in the image. That's interesting. So, so the whole thing that we've been making a big point uh, about is that you need a certain amount of ambiguity to let the reader fill it in. You're saying, uh-uh, let me make my message clear. Not, in, you, not in the case. I mean, when you're well, doing- I think that's art. when it's an art, when it's art serving advocacy or, or editorial point of view, you must, yeah, you must, uh, you know, remove the ambiguity. You're at- Point in a, dire in a direction. Wait, yeah. Dave, say that, say, Dave, say the, that again. The has to point in a specific direction, I think, when especially if you're doing political art, overt, overt political art. Now, some people exactly. would say if it is some people would say if it is too clear, that's an op ed. That's a commentary. That's not art. Well, um, that, art. But an op ed can be art. I mean, but, you know, if you're if a political piece, especially, you know, most political art, it's got to it's got to have teeth. It's got to it's got to have it's got to have fangs for the most part. Um, and, you know, 
if it's friendly, it, it wouldn't work. So, you know, in that regard on that, for the, 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 the Trump cover that, uh, that Moby was referencing, you know, there's no, you know, any ambiguity in there would, would, wouldn't serve the purpose of the cover. Uh, unless somebody might construe it that I'm against sailboats. Okay. Uh, I, th I think what was striking about that, that cover was that it was a, just a clever, different, simple take uh, on something that nobody had ever thought of before. Oh, well, thank you. I, I have to say again how much fun it's been to work on this, Neil, with you and and with Dave. And in the, the, the most exciting part, I think, about for me in the, in the world of creativity, besides solving problems such as, you know, how to form a chord in a certain way at a certain place on the neck of the guitar, or how to get a certain sound is is the aspect of collaboration and what what working with other people brings to artistic expression and how it can be expansive you know the the idea that you have in your in your head um, that you then come out and share with somebody else they bring they then bring to it what they have and uh and that just uh, in in doing this video project you know it just went it went into a whole another realm which is the visual direction and you know uh, I, I find that to be a very exciting uh creative work I so to, thank you well yeah. i have to give a quick shout out to jeremy galente who was the animator absolutely that, yes you know i basically just made puppets but like he like made them come to life Deborah, blame Jeremy. He's the one who did the neurosurgery. Is that right? Uh, I think I had the, uh, I, I did plan in the guy getting shaved and getting the, the helmet put on his head. But Jeremy, I think, threw in the, the hat on the, the same hat on the boss. What people miss is that the boss watches the guy doing his thing when he's, his mind is freed, and that's what he wants to tap into. And that's when the hat comes into play, is when others want to tap into his energy, not that they're trying to subdue him to this corporate energy. That's right. how and, I interpret it. And it's all know? orange juice. And it's all, yeah, it's all, yeah, it's all orange juice. So that, what the hell, you know? It's all orange juice? <laughs> it's all good. It's the orange lights. It's not ah, okay. All right, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pretend that meant something. Ambiguity is the devil's skate key. <laughs> Thank you. This has been um, an invigorating, troubling, dispiriting, and uh, <laughs> and at and the same inspiring. time, one, <laughs> yes, and it's inspiring conversation. Thanks to all of you for being for being part of this program today. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Ferme tes yeux Petit à petit Le jour s'affaiblit Dans le ciel Papillon